Masters this afternoon, London this evening, and so um, they've got it in high gear, and uh, please pray for them for strength, amen, amen, but uh, God is good all the time, amen, and uh, we're going to just uh, let them come and let them minister the burden that's in their heart, let's receive what God is doing through them and what God is doing in their field of calling, amen, would you just open your hearts right now and let the Lord speak to you here today. Brother and Sister Calhoun, such a pleasure to have you with us, thank you for coming and visiting us here in the grand city of Cambridge. You're always welcome here. Amen. God bless you, Brother Calhoun. Praise God, everybody. Amen. You can be seated. Good to be here with you folks, especially our, our good friends, the Moorheads, their family. You guys are awesome. And uh, we were here a few years ago, a different location. But man, look what God is doing and has done. It's really exciting. And uh, I'm just so happy. Also, really good to see my friends, Lloyd and Laura, my Highland friends from Scotland. Amen. I come in, I, I was focused, just got here, and, and I just before service, I realized, oh my goodness, yeah, Laura's here. Yeah. Amen. Last time I saw them were like in Scotland, I believe. Yeah. Edinburgh. God is good. So good to be here. You ready to go for a little... Drive? <laughs> All right. I want to be young, so I'm going to say it this way. Cue the vid. There you go. Let's go to the Netherlands. You got to put your seatbelt on. I want to, no, no, come on, everybody, put your seatbelt on. I want to see it click into place. How many have heard of Holland? Holland is like two of the 12 provinces, but most people call the whole thing Holland. This is a few things the Dutch invented. You got to eat raw herring to be Dutch. So I had two. And 25% of their land was once under the ocean. Beautiful windmills that are 450 years old pump the water up and over the dikes, creating this beautiful, fertile soil that was once under the Atlantic. And 80% of the world's tulips come from the Netherlands. Even guys are allowed to like tulips. They're beautiful. Bridges that are architectural masterpieces in themselves bridges that lift up to let the boats go through the canals and this is a bridge for bicycles above the highway and the bikes are awesome 18 million bikes for 17 million people this is a three-story parking garage for your bike don't forget where you parked it and this is the single most beautiful gorgeous cyclist in all the Netherlands right it's my wife 1.6 million people in the greater Amsterdam area please pray for this incredible city. Beautiful, 1,753 bridges in one city. But it's not the architecture or the boats or bridges, it's the people and their incredible need for Jesus. It's literally known as the most liberal city in the entire world. With euthanasia, that's assisted suicide and, and prostitution is legal as well as, as many drugs. And so it's very, very wicked and desperately needs Jesus. It's not the beauty of the, the fields or the windmills. It's the people, 17 million people that are very, very diverse. They, they come here literally from all over the world and every continent. It's very uh, urban. It's very uh, multicultural. It's an incredible nation in just a little small area, only about 120 miles across the Netherlands, but with so many people. This is a satellite image of Europe at night. And you can see the lights of London, England, and this is Paris, France, but the brightest light from Europe, sorry, Laura, but it's from the Netherlands <laughs> because it's the most congested with people area in all of Europe. Just 120 miles across this little nation with so many people, just city after city after city. And God called us to reach people, disciple people, and to empower people. And so we will do this two ways basically number one we're called to plant churches and number two to train and send leaders to a, a, a part-time bible school so these are the 30 largest cities in the netherlands can you say the name of jesus over these cities it's literally as we're traveling wanting to be there god is connecting us with people and it's just amazing met a dutch family in iowa uh, that has connections and and uh, came out to church. We met another family that has someone in the Netherlands. We sent someone to meet them, taught them a Bible study, 
and baptize them in Jesus' name, right, in the Netherlands. In Hoven, we have a connection there now. Uh, just hundreds of thousands of people. Utrecht, 350,000 people. These cities are ancient with occasionally castles and all, miles and miles and miles of cobblestone streets and markets mixed with, of course, modern universities. Rotterdam is the largest European port. Hitler bombed it to nothingness in the Second World War, but it's grown up to be an architectural masterpiece. It's beautiful. And The Hague, where Carl and I will be living and planning a church in Jesus' name. And so we're really excited about this city. The Hague, Rotterdam is really one metroplex now, and it's 3.5 million people. This is where the tribunals, where the war criminals are judged. The judicial arm of the UN is headquartered there, and 160 human rights organizations are here. The police force of the European Union is headquartered here. Please pray for the strategic city that they call the Center of Peace and Justice. That we were doing prayer walks when we took these pictures. This picture, it was outside in The Hague and meeting people and connecting. There's 51% of The Hague was born outside of the Netherlands. So it's literally one of the most uh, international cities in the entire world. The Bible has called us, you and I, given us a commission to preach the gospel and sent us to, do, and to preach deliverance and recovering of sight and to set our liberty them that are bruised in Jesus' name. And so we link with the Tuttle family, who's now the regional director of all of Europe and the Middle East, but he created a great uh, a foundation there. Goncalves and the Winklers are the two pastors we have in uh, the Netherlands and Dordrecht and Hoofdorf. These are some of the church folk and those two churches. And Baron and Jen are AIM missionaries. These are our daughters, Janessa and Amy. Amy just turned 20, actually, so that's old news. And uh, so please pray for our kids. Our youngest is our third year of Bible college. And so God is awesome. We have some stuff to sell at our table. It helps with uh, some of our projects. And uh, we'd love to be a for someone who would like to be a partner. God bless you in Jesus' name. Are you ready to learn a little bit of Dutch? You don't look ready. Amen. Let's sing together if you can. We're still learning ourselves. God bless you. De koning in zijn pracht, bekleed met der aan met. Kom maar ik word gaan, ar ik word gaan. Het juiste vres zijn licht, als hij ik wat ik riek, dan vloek ik wordt zijn stem. Vloek hij wordt zijn stem, maar groot dan ze God. Zing met mij maat groot dan ze God. Zing wat gij is groot, zo groot dan ze God. Maat groot dan ze God. My mat groot aan de God, zing wat gij is groot, zo groot aan de God. Dan zing mijn ziel tot u, o heel mijn God, hoe God zij taal. Who God zijt gij? Dan zing mijn ziel tot u, o heel mijn God. Who God zijt gij? Who God zijt gij? Dan zing. Oh, heal 
mein Gott, who holds thy time, who holds thy time, dann singt mein Seel to du, oh hier mein Gott, who holds Let's sing it together. Let's worship him. How great. Hallelujah. You are so awesome, Lord. Let's everybody stand together. For Jesus sings my soul. My Savior God to thee. How great thou art. Oh, Jesus. How great thou art. Hallelujah. Let's thank him together. We worship you, Jesus. We magnify you, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. 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 We lift up your name. Jesus, we lift up your name. Jesus, we lift up your name. Jesus, your word, your cross. Your blood, your resurrection. We bless you, O God. We bless you, O God. Hallelujah. So a few years ago, I was asked by Brother Kelly to preach, to teach a part-time Bible school in Scotland through Skype. You remember those days, Laura? Through Skype. My Skype in Ireland, when I lived in Ireland, wasn't working that great. And he asked me to preach, or teach rather, the book of Ezekiel. And I'm like, teaching the book of Ezekiel about the wheel, in the middle of the wheel, and all that stuff, through a faulty Skype connection <laughs> to international students. I said, God, how can I do this? And it's such a complicated book that Hebrew scholars said, they would only let their people read their, the book of Ezekiel after they became 35 years of age. That's true. Hebrew scholars, you can't even read it until you're 35. And so I'm going to teach this thing. And so I said, God, where do I start? And this is what came to me. Read it. And so I said, okay, God, I'm going to read it. So I read it. In the first verse, God spoke to me, and I was instantly excited about teaching the book of Ezekiel. And so I've taught lots in the book of Ezekiel since. Amen. Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, I was among the captives by the river of Chebar, that the heavens were open, and I saw visions of God. Verse 3, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Chebar, and the hand of the Lord was there upon me. Amen. And the, the text, I guess, and the, or the title would be Delivered from Expectation. Amen. Is that okay title? Can you live with that one? Okay, good. Well, let's pray one more time, can we? Jesus, you're awesome. You're holy. You're worthy. Thank you for your goodness, your mercy, your love. I pray, God, that you would give us strength and that you would speak to every person, every heart, and to the core of this church. In the name of Jesus Christ, transform us, empower us, and send us. In the name of Jesus, it's harvest time, Lord. Help us in Jesus' name. Everybody say, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. And it's kind of crazy. Here he was. He was 30 years old. He was in line to be a, a priest or a Levite, a temple worker, but now the temple is rubble. And uh, he's a prisoner of war. His land has been 
bashed and beaten and, and people that he's known all of his life has been killed. And it's just an absolute mess back in Jerusalem. Remember Daniel, when he got in the same situation, he was in the same group possibly, but he was down in Babylon and when he prayed, he faced Jerusalem. Well, we know that we don't face Jerusalem because, because the Holy Ghost is in us, Christ in us, the hope of glory. We don't need to go to the Western Wall because you're the temple of the Holy Ghost, right? But at the same time, you need to recognize how important it was to them at that time and how God used them in their day Everything they knew, their focus, their temple, their, their city that God promised, the land that God hallowed and gave to them was gone. And they were in a prison camp. They weren't in Babylon yet, but they weren't home. The, the sound of the war and the cries of terror, the smell of blood like would still be there, sorrow and aching in their spirit. And here he is. In amongst the captives in a prison camp, living in a tent, not sure what they were going to do with them. And the heavens were open, and I saw visions of God, which tells me that I don't do, thank God for the great worship leading here today and the anointing and, and the, p, the piano, but it tells me that I don't need a piano. It tells me that we don't need a certain feel or a certain atmosphere to hear from God, that God is bigger than atmosphere. That God is, supersedes what we see or what we feel. It also, this scripture takes away my excuse and your excuse too. Doesn't it? Like we can't say, oh, well, I'm just having a bad day. Well, you're probably not having as bad a day as they were. <laughs> and, and the heavens were open and he saw visions of God. And then verse 3, the hand of the Lord was there upon me. The hand of the Lord was there upon me. Do you ever, ever just feel like the Lord just put his hand on your shoulder? Amen. It's incredible to know you can be in the will of God with all this mess going around you when there's, there's, there's no possible configuration. I hate it when you're just going through like hell on earth and you, and you got someone speaking into your ear trying to figure out and explain how this all works together for wonderful things. You know what I'm saying? It's like, oh yeah, this... The reason you got a flat tire is because your engine was about to go and you would have been crushed on the highway. So thank God for that flat tire. Look, please. <laughs> They're just trying to figure out what greater deal, this great, incredible meaning out of this everyday occurrence, right? But I'm glad that we don't have to do that because right in the middle of chaos, you can have God's hand rest upon you. And I go from there uh, all the way over to the book of Revelations, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later, in the New Covenant people, John was in a prison camp in Revelations chapter 1-1 on the Isle of Patmos. And history tells us, if you study, the, that the people bringing the captives to the prison island wouldn't stop the boat and dock the boat at the pier because it was too dangerous. They would be killed. And so they would throw the captives overboard and they would have to swim to shore. And many of them died before they got to shore. So John is being persecuted, thrown overboard, swims to shore. He's in up on an island, a prison camp, for his faith, and the Bible said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I turned, and he began to see a vision from God, and I thought, that's so cool, because two entirely different circumstances, and two different dispensations of time, but we see how, if we are able 
to look past what we see, we can literally uh, look into the eternal and, our, and God's hand literally can be upon us. You, you could go there to the uh, Acts chapter 3 when Peter's on his way to the temple at the hour of prayer. And a guy that was broke because he was sick and he was lame. See, now we might have pensions or welfare and all kinds of wonderful things that I believe in for people that are really, really needy. But they didn't have those kind of things. And so if you were lame, you couldn't work physically. They didn't have any, a lot of IT jobs <laughs> in those days. They weren't building iPhones. And so if you couldn't work with your hands and your feet, you couldn't work. And there was no money, and so he was begging for money. And then this other broke guy came by that didn't have any money either. And he said, silver and gold, have I none? So you got a sick, lame, hungry, poor, broke person asking money from a broke saint of God who said, I can't give you anything, I'm broke too. And that is when he said, but such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. And I've walked through the scriptures, just three different illustrations, but we could name 20 or 50 or 100. And we find that God does not need a spotlight, right? That God does not need a special moment. Amen. I'm, I'm from the 80s, okay? I still think we should have our collar up. I like skinny ties. Glad they're starting to come back, but they don't look good on chubby people. And so I'm, you know, skinny ties. And I, my wife will say to me, it's not a can. Because I say, I got to go use the can, man. Right? It's the loo, it's in, in the UK, it's the WC, the water closet. I said, got to use the can, man, because I, I want to feel young. <laughs> 80s gave us ghetto blasters and like things like this that we carried to school, <laughs> right? Yeah. And mega bass boom, and, but atmosphere, everything had to be atmosphere. And so I remember when I was a young preacher, I mean... We, we used to think that when people said, okay, let's bow our heads and pray, that was time for us to get set up for the next stuff, for the next song, you know. I mean, you, you, they're all closing their eyes to pray, so it's now it's like, okay, get this ready, get, this, get the speakers up there, man, you know. I mean, it's atmosphere. We've got to create this atmosphere. And then I'm finding out that Jesus never needed that, that he needed people, he needed faith. If you go to Ezekiel 47, the Bible tells us that it started as a house, but it became a river. And we talk about the man and the line with the line in his hand measured, and the river was up to my ankles and knees and waist, and then rivers to swim in. And that is speaking of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. But it's not just speaking about the outpouring of the Holy Ghost and the depths of the river. But it's also speaking about the substance change from a stationary building to a fluid river. And see, he was trying to tell us, he was trying to tell us, you know, the kingdom was a temple. And even when you're in Babylon, you pray to the temple and, and head, put your head where you think that direction is. But in the New Testament, the kingdom is a people. And out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. The spake of the Holy Ghost, which they should receive. And so when you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you, you didn't become a, here's the church, here's the steeple, open up the church, see all the people. That church and the steeple is not the church, thank God, right? But you became the church, the ecclesia, 
which is the called out ones, the body of Christ. And, and so again, you may be broke, talking to broke people. You may be on a prison camp. You may be, you may be in a refugee camp like Ezekiel. It doesn't matter where. The river is inside of you, and it's supposed to flow out. Amen? In, I think it was 2015, but just a couple years ago, in the Netherlands, they had global warming in reverse, as we've been seeing across the world. Um, the, the world got colder, and so the problem with it getting cold and having a long winter in the Netherlands is it interferes with the tulip festival. The tulip festival in the Netherlands is very, very important because of the fact that Canada was the liberators in the Second World War. Three of my uncles fought for the liberation of Holland, and so that's exciting to me that God sent us back, and he gave me a church name for our church plant, Freedom Church. Amen. But they send every year thousands of tulips to Ottawa. They still do. Uh, for thanks for 71 years ago for liberating them from Nazis. Amen. But every year they have this tulip festival and people come, the hundreds of thousands of people from all over the world, they come to the Netherlands, to Holland for this beautiful festival. It's all about tulips. Everything is about tulips. I mean, it's tulips. You, you, you buy tulips. You, I mean, it's just incredible. You take pictures, photographers, you know, with their big cameras and everything, look, trying to look smart, you know, just taking pictures. Selfies with tulips, right? And so all of the Netherlands prepares for it counts on it because of the money that's generated from tourists and and so it's awesome the problem is winter was too long and it put off the growth of tulips and so there were no tulip bulbs for tulip festival so what do you do you got like million pastor we got millions of people we got all these people coming we got we got all kinds of festivals planned we got tulips 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 but no tulips and so they're like, what do we do? And they're frantic and they're scrambling. And so what they did is they, they developed something, of course. I mean, very, very creative. I'm being sarcastic. But they created tulip beer. That's true. And then they had like tulip-shaped cake. Right? Cake in the shape of a beautiful big tulip. And they had like little... Tulip-shaped chocolates that would sit on the edge of your non-alcoholic drink, on the edge of the glass. They had tulip festival. They had tulip balloons. They had, you know, Delft fine porcelain from Delft, Netherlands, in the shape of tulips and painters painting tulips. And everywhere you look, there's tulip everything, but there's no tulips. I read that, I'm like, oh my goodness, that's like the church sometime, right? We, we can get so, I mean, we, we can sing about them, right? Everything we do is, it's wrapped up around Jesus, and, and, and we, we got to get this right, and, and we got to do this. Everything is wrapped around Jesus, but it's possible for, for us to have a festival of Jesus with no Jesus, right? And so we get so into the festival that we forget. It's like having a birthday party. You ever been to your own birthday party and you're thinking, did they come because they like me? Or did they come because they wanted to party? You, know, you ever just think that sometimes? It's like, who? anyone got a birthday? That random person over there, great, great, let's have a party. It's really not about you. It's just a party. You ever feel like that? Well, maybe Jesus feels that way sometimes because at times we can be so 
structured in our minds. Right? A few years ago, uh, I hope this is okay. Am I making any sense? A few years ago, I was doing a joint, and I'm not making fun of anyone, okay? Just so you know to start with. But I'm doing this joint funeral, and uh, I can't be dignified even when I try. I really try. Take out my little, my wife said, make sure that's just right. I really do try. And so I'm doing this uh, funeral with this very re religious le leader that was very, very, very important. And so we're going through the ceremonies. And, and I was starting to sweat because when he walked up the aisle, he, the aisle, it was like he knew how to walk like a bride. You know what I'm saying? And, and the robes and everything was just so. And then when he was talking about the deceased and praying, he opened his prayer book and it was just, it was really, actually it was really good. It was skillful. And he was very uh, poetic. And he had a, like a kind of a Irish feel to his speech, so he did. <laughs> and so it is so good to be with you people tonight. And it was just so beautiful. And I thought, I started to sweat because I'm thinking, okay, from it's a long ways to the grave and we're going to be in the same car. <laughs> and he's not going to like me. <laughs> so I'm really, really trying, right? And so I went out, my, the funeral director is a, a, a friend of mine, and I went out and I just jumped in the back seat. Really, you know, I'm like, okay, whew, I'm here. And... Uh, Sure enough, the man with the robe, he's just like so awesome. Yeah, so good to be with you tonight. And he comes out, and he gets into the front seat, or he gets into the car, and I hear a zipping sound. It goes, zip, <laughs> off comes the robe, honest, jeans and a T-shirt. And he, I am not lying. <laughs> I'm not lying. He turns and looks at me, and he goes, hey, so you went to skiing? It happened too fast. I, I couldn't, I'm like, uh, skiing. <laughs> no, 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 I didn't do that. <laughs> but I was like, I, my brain was too, I was still like, I, I'm not used to you being like an everyday guy yet. Just let's break into this slowly. You know what I'm saying? And I thought, you know, I was sitting in the car feeling smug. It's like, we don't do that. Yeah, we do. <laughs> Just as bad. Just as bad. You know, when I became a pastor, I was 21 years of age. And up until that point, you know, people meet me and say, hey, what are you doing? Hey, what's up, man? People in the mall that I went to school with, all of a sudden I'm a pastor. I walk through the mall and they're like, oh, Brother Calhoun. Oh, I'm coming to your church Sunday. I'm like, you haven't been in church in 10 years. Praise the Lord. God has given us such a lovely day, hasn't he? He really has, brother. I'm like, what was that? Because <laughs> I'm a pastor now. You talk different to pastors, right? But come on, we're having fun, aren't we? But what, what, we're, what are we talking about? We're talking about expectation. What happens is, and we're talking about the kingdom of God. We, we, we build expectation around church services. We build expectation around midwinter youth conferences. Right? But the problem is, is that when I read the holy book, I see God doing things more outside of those kind of events than inside of those kind of events. Can I, can I throw you another example? Okay, because I was. This is how the Lord talks to me. I was reading the Bible, and the Lord asked me a question. First, first he, he gave me one single word, and the word was encounter. Everybody say encounter. And the word encounter means, an, in the origin, it means an unplanned or unexpected meeting, right? And so, what's your name, brother? Leon. 
call, hey man, two o'clock, Tim Hortons, tomorrow at two. Tim, double, double. Right? Well, we may have a good time, but that's not an encounter because we planned it, right? But I'm saying, hey bro, man, I can't believe you're here. Whoa. I just happened to meet him uptown. I'm like, I remember you from the church. Can we sit down? And so we take a minute to hang out. It's an encounter because it was unplanned. So the question the Lord asked me is this, is if you take all the miracles of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all the miracles of Jesus in the Gospels, think of all those miracles, and then take all the miracles of the apostles in the book of Acts, all of those miracles that apostles performed in the book of Acts. So all of the New Testament miracles of Jesus and the apostles, how many of those were a result of a planned meeting? None. Thank you. I looked it up. None. There was no miracle. Not one time did Jesus ever say, oh, I'm sorry that you're bleeding. <laughs> That is too bad. Someone, you know, someone stop the bleeding because we're having a youth service three weeks from tonight and we have an evangelist coming. And we'll pray for you there. <laughs> right? It's like there's a funeral going on right there on the road right now. Right? Someone's crying out. The disciples... They've seen him do it over and over, but it's so hard for God's people to understand what God is doing, and so we miss it. They're like, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up, and Jesus said, don't shut him up. I want to heal him. Oh, sorry about that. What do you want Jesus to do? You see that over and over and over and over by the disciples. Like, like there's, there's a big crusade happening. There's thousands of people that have followed Jesus out to the desert. And you can feel the pulse of this incredible, incredible conference that is happening. Jesus is the keynote preacher. And they're over there. And they've got everything cued and everything's going to happen. And, and they're like, okay, Jesus, it's time for you to speak. And where's Jesus? He's over there on the ground, on the grass with kids. <laughs> Tell me that one again. He's over there hanging out with the kids. And the Bible said that they were so mad that they rebuked the mothers for bringing the kids. And the Bible said that Jesus was greatly, uh, 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 greatly displeased and rebuked them. And so rebuke is a very strong word, right? It's not like, oh, you shouldn't do this. No, rebuke is like, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I mean, it's strong language. And it is like these people that, that Jesus had called had got their whole mindset wrapped around what they think God was going to do and how he thought they thought he was going to do it. They could not fathom that maybe Jesus is up to something really special over here in the corner playing with the kids. Amen. And they missed it. And they missed it. And they missed it. And it was to teach them and to teach us that the kingdom is about encounters. I don't, I don't always preach like this. A, a deputation. I, I can't even remember the last time I preached this, this kind of way, a deputation. But the Lord spoke to me. I only had a few minutes between one service and the next. And the Lord said that, that there's something that he wants to do in Cambridge. That there's something he wants to do with this group of people. We, we've, got to, we've got to shake our head. We've got to shake the cobwebs and the mindsets and the false expectations out of our brain. You gotta, you gotta shake that. The, here's the church. Here's the steeple business out of our brains. You're the church. You're the people. And God can do it in the cafeteria. God can do it at work. God can do it in your home. God can do it at Tim Hortons. And God wants to engage His people, His church, His way. Daily in community in Jesus' name. This is what I'm finding. I'm going to try to stop. 
So I'm sure you'll be pleased. <laughs> um, this is what I find is that the things that I work the hardest of don't end up mattering. And then some little silly thing, God just... I'll give you an illustration of this. I was, you know, when you, when you happen to be in the area and you get to preach, let me just preach your kind of pressure. But when you happen to be here and, oh, well, you're going to be in London, you can preach here too. Well, that's great. You should do a pretty good job. But, you know, it's not like if you played for a $2,000 for a plane ticket, I was here anyways. <laughs> but I remember one time they actually flew me in. That, bro, is scary. Okay? That is scary. Because there's pressure. It's like, oh, we paid for a plane ticket out of our pocket. And I remember I was like, because this is how I preach. (laughs) And I'm thinking, Lord, this is not what they want. (laughs) And so I remember I was in the prayer room before service, they were having a prayer meeting, pre-service prayer meeting. And so I was walking back. I was looking at my notes. Oh, God, is this okay? Is this what you wanted? Please help me to say this. Even in the New Testament, Apollo was an orator. Give me an Apollo's oratory tonight. It has to be good. In Jesus' name. And I'm looking at my notes and I'm praying, God, I, I want to say the right things. And Jesus, you know, and I was so nerved up. This is, this is quite a while ago. and I'll never forget this. Everyone's filtering out into the sanctuary, out of the prayer room, into the sanctuary, and I'm, it's time. I mean, I, 6.30, Sunday evening service, so I filter out. As I'm walking out of the prayer room, there's a boy there that's about 12 years old sitting there. He's the only one in the prayer room beside me. And as I'm walking past him, the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, have him lay your, his hands on you and pray for you. So I'm looking at him. I'm looking at you. Okay, I have safe to say this. Girls are beautiful. I've got two daughters. Girls are always beautiful. But guys, come on. They hit that age. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's funny because that's the age that girls start getting attracted to guys. I mean, they ha- you know, they're just like, they grow up, and, but not out yet, and it's like your voice has changed. It's like, ah. you know what I'm saying? It's, so I'm looking at this 12-year-old boy that's in that awkward stage of his life, looking really, really awkward, and he's sitting there in the prayer room looking nervous. And God said, have him lay hands on you and pray for you. So I'm like, okay. So I walk over. I'm like, hey. He goes, hey. I'm like, I want you to lay hands on me. And pray for me that God would use me tonight. And he's like, <laughs> and so it was really awkward. No one else is around. And so he gets up and he comes over and he's looking really like his eyes are like, hmm. and he lays his hand on my shoulder. And I said, no, 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 right on my hand, or right on my head. Put your hand right here and pray that God would use me tonight to preach his word. And so he goes, God, um, help him to like do a good job. Like, okay, God, <laughs> he's gone. Like he got out of there, he just <laughs> bolted. And I'm standing there like that was really awkward. That was, that was really awful. <laughs> and so I walk in the sanctuary, Pastor, scratch on my head, thinking, I missed it. Like that, <laughs> like that couldn't have been God. And for, preached. Forgot about it, went home. Several years later, I get a call from the pastor of that church. And he said, I just got to tell you that, that I had a young man in my office. He's going to Bible school. And he said, Pastor, I've got to tell you about my call. He said, when I first came to this church, my family had, wasn't coming. And I was the only one that came. And I was feeling really awkward. And, and uh, I was sitting in the prayer room. And you had... A guy here preaching, and he came over to me, and he said, I want you to lay your hands on me, and I want you to pray for me. And he said, the moment I laid my hand on his head, the Lord spoke to me and said, this is just the beginning. I'm going to use you. I've got a call on your life. 
His name, you know, his name is John Beach. And I got to preach for John Beach because that gangly kid is a pastor now and a great man of God. And you know what? I thought, I thought, when I go back to that area where I preached and I was so nervous, I've gained like 40 pounds since then. They don't even recognize me. Not one solitary person remembers my sermon. But John Beach will never forget me. <laughs> There's some John Beach moments with God's people in Cambridge in Jesus' name. Moments, moments that matter, moments that matter, moments of sensitivity, moments that are in divine encounters. And it don't look like church. It don't look like it should be. It doesn't matter. I felt the hand of God on my shoulder. Hallelujah. Let's stand together in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Indeed, there is a prophetic anointing even on this province of Ontario right now. And, and in this church, you can feel it so strongly. God is doing a new thing. God is, is taking weary saints that have, that have tried and has gone through things. And he's given us, um, he's given us a door of possibility. He's given us a door to the community, a door of, of revival. If we will look past circumstance right now, God is going to direct you. I'm speaking to you as individual and to this church collectively. God is going to direct you to people in the name of Jesus Christ. Don't you think it has to be big? Don't you think you have to pray like Lee Stone King? You pray like you pray. You say the things that you would say. And God is going to direct your words and your ministry and your testimony. And God is going to revolutionize cultures in the name of Jesus Christ right now.